Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Thank you for joining us again this week on the program. We've been having an absolute blast the last couple weeks. And uh, if you've missed these programs, good news, you can go back and watch them. They're archived on YouTube. I'll talk about that in just a moment, but I have on the set again with me this week my uh, pastor, who is a senior pastor of the church that I attend, Pastor Lisa Unger, and uh, it's good to have you on the program with me again. She is also my uh, my uh, younger sister, and so uh, she's written a new book called Unblemished, and we've been talking about that for the last couple of weeks, and, and uh, man, this is just a powerful, powerful book that I believe will bless you if you go get your copy on Amazon and, or you get it on your Kindle, whatever. But the theme of this book, again, is what disqualified you under the Old Covenant. Jesus heals it in the New Covenant. When, when uh, the book of Leviticus said, you know, uh, speak to Aaron, say whoever he be, this is Leviticus 21, verse 17, of thy seed in their generations that has any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. For whatsoever man he be that has a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man or a lame or he that has a flat nose or anything superfluous or a man that is broken footed or broken handed or crooked back or a dwarf or hath a blemish in his eye or be scurvy or scabbed or has his stones broken. No man that has a blemish of the seed of Aaron shall come nigh to offer the offering of the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish, he shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his God. And what Pastor Lisa did in this book She's taken every one of these that would have been disqualified in Leviticus 21 and shows you how in the New Covenant or in the New Testament Jesus comes on the scene who is the ultimate high priest and heals every one of these blemished disqualified to show us really that there's nobody that's blemished or disqualified that he cannot touch and heal and transform their lives. The Old Covenant is about a government of condemnation. 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through several verses, we read it in the first program, says that the Old Covenant was a government of condemnation and the New Covenant is a government of affirmation. And so when Jesus came on the scene, Lisa said this in the first program, His very opening message, His first sermon to all the world is, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He's anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news, to the poor, to bind up the broken heart, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to declare the year of favor of our God. And He closed the book. He didn't say some glad morning. He said, this day the Scripture is fulfilled okay. in yours. And He began introducing the kingdom because what the kingdom is about is taking what was disqualified and blemished and removing the blemishes and the disqualifications. And so Jesus heals uh, we talked about the dwarf was Zacchaeus. We talked about the, the, the hunchback was the woman bowed to the earth. We talked about the blind man washing in the pool of Siloam. We talked about uh, superfluous. And we talked about uh, the woman with an issue of blood. And we talked about the withered hand being fivefold ministry. And there's so many powerful things that are here. But Jesus healed every one of these. Because he was, under the old covenant, they were disqualified from the right. bread of their God. But he was the true bread that came down from heaven. Right. Jesus said, your fathers ate man in the wilderness and are dead, but I'm the true bread that came down from heaven. I was thinking even as we were talking about that uh, little boy that came with five loaves and two fishes, you know, and he supplied for them the, that the, the generation to come, the next generation have something to offer that can sustain the next great move of God are the things right. that we might need. But I, I, I was thinking also, I did a study, some on that myself, I've been sharing some along the line, but that was really even a picture of Jesus coming, bringing them all the way back to the wilderness journey when He said, you know what, your fathers ate man in the wilderness, they're dead, but I'm the true bread that came right. down from heaven. So He was really bringing them back to show them, I'm the bread. Yeah. You're not disqualified, you're not too broken, you're not beyond God's help. 
And so all these things are about that. And the book's called Unblemished. And it, you, you, we're not going to be able to go into near the details that you can get from this book, but go get it. But I'll just talk about that a little bit more. You want to talk about, I think, the man that's got a broken foot or something on this one, and maybe a few others, and we'll see what we can cover on it. But Yeah, so we see the picture, you know, when you see the list of all the blemishes and all the thing that's done, and then you get over into the New Testament, and you start looking at the miracles that Jesus did, you realize it's the list. Yeah. It's kind of almost like the hit list. Yeah. You know, he goes down through that list and so and and he begins to restore everybody who was on the list. Yeah. And he begins to go down through and heal and bring healings in their life. And I believe, you know, I believe God, Jesus did literal natural miracles, sure. you know, in people's body. I also think there's a spiritual significance, Absolutely. you know, in each one of those when he we look at them. He handpicked them. When he, the woman that's bowed over, I believe, you know, you know, I believe Jesus healed her back. Yeah. I believe she stood upright, yeah. but I believe he deals with her identity. And I also believe when we look at the picture of the church, you know, that God wants to cause the church to stand the upright, right. the woman to yeah. stand upright, to be healed, to behold, to realize she's a daughter of Abraham and she has a right to the inheritance of the kingdom. Yeah. of God and what's been paid for. Yeah. You know, even my prayer life lately, I say, Lord, you know what? You paid for my healing at Calvary. I'm yep. cashing in on it. I'm going to cash yep. in on some things that's been paid for. Yep. And I think if we realize, you know, that Jesus was on a mission, and I believe a lot of what the New Testament things that are done, he's on a mission to seek and to save that which was lost and to restore some things. And, um, you know, he gives the parable of the great feast. He makes an invitation to all those who have broken, the halt, the lame, the blind, the crippled, and he brings them in. Jesus was continually moved by compassion by people when he would come into the crowds and said he would be moved with compassion. And, um, you know, he, he was constantly getting in trouble as well. It's a why does your master hang out with publicans and sinners and outcasts? And, you know, and he said those who are whole don't need a physician but those who are sick. And so he's on a mission to heal those who are sick. And so he gives us some demonstrations in there. And so he gives the list, you know, we've talked about the man that's born blind and a sin consciousness when we, you know, we get so hung up on why is he blind? Did he sin or his parents sin or is it a generational curse, you know? And we, we throw stuff like that around. I don't know that we even really know what that's all about, but Jesus said it's not even about that, but that the works of God might mm -hmm. be made manifest. And he begins to restore people. And one of the people that uh, he restores in there, if you were crippled or if you were lame or if you had a broken foot, you were disqualified, uh, you know, from the kingdom. And uh, I, you see the picture where the man is laid by the pool of Bethesda. And he's been laid there for a very long time. And the scripture says that Every so often came the troubling of the waters, and whoever gets to the water first gets the healing. Mm -hmm. And I think that the scripture says the man's been there like 18 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking just in my mindset, well, if I've been doing this for 18 years, and I know that the pattern is whoever gets there first, whoever carries me there tomorrow, I'm going to say, just lay me on the edge. Because if the trouble, if the waters get troubled, I'm gonna tuck and roll, or yeah. I'm gonna do my <laughs> army crawl, or Sounds I'm gonna like do me something. Yeah. Because if that's the deal, yeah. and I really want to be made whole, I'm gonna figure out how to get to that water. Right. I'm gonna figure out how to make a connection. So don't lay me back on the bank somewhere. Put me on the edge, yeah. and I'll roll myself in or something, you know. Uh, but I think sometimes we can get in such a uh, system of well, this is just the norm. I preached at one time a man called Norm. It was normal. And after 18 years, I think sometimes you just figure this is normal. But, you know, sometimes normal can be the enemy of your yep. miracle because we accept some things, I think, sometimes that aren't ours to yep. accept. And so he lays there and Jesus simply says to him, Wilt thou be made whole? To you and I, the answer is yes. Right? Yeah. You know, yes, I want to be made whole. He says, I have no man to put me in the water. And before I get down there, somebody gets there ahead of me and gets my blessing. Somebody gets my healing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so I, wrong answer, right? Because the answer is yes, I want to be made whole. Whatever it takes for me to be made whole, that's what I want. Mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, I want to be made whole. 
And so Jesus asked the man the question, and he says, well, I have no man. And, you know, too often we wait on man yep. to be the source or the answer of what our healing is when it's not in man. Yep. Man's not ever going to be the answer to what yep. you need. And he says, will you be made whole? And so Jesus says to him, you know, be healed, rise, take up your bed and walk. And so he gets, you know, the man gets his healing and he gets up out of there. And I, and I seriously believe that Jesus told him to take up his bed and walk because what gets the man in trouble, what gets Jesus in trouble, not just the miracle, it's because the man carries his bed on the Sabbath day. You know, we've talked about this some already, that he was constantly in trouble for doing miracles on the Sabbath day. The man who, you know, was there in the beginning and breathed breath into man and he became a living soul and hung the stars in the heavens don't know how to read a calendar, yeah. right? You know, Created the seventh day himself. Yeah, yeah, he creates the seventh day, but he don't know what day of the week it is, you know. Yeah. But, you know, because it's the Sabbath day, this gentleman picks up his bed and he carries his bed and he says, you can't carry your bed on the Sabbath day. But I really believe that Jesus says to him, rise, take up in your bed and walk, because if you don't roll up where you were, if you don't pick up that bed and carry it with you, you're tempted to go back yep. to what you used to do. Yeah. You know, I think about the scripture after Jesus is crucified, you know, and the disciples are in that transition state, right? Because the man they put all their confidence in, three and a half years in Bible school, you know, with this man, this Messiah, and all of a sudden he's crucified and, you know, he's gone to the cross. And in that transition time, Peter says, I'm going fishing. And the other disciples said, well, if you're going fishing, then I'm going fishing. Mm -hmm. Because what we're tempted to do in a season of our life sometimes, and, and in ministry, yeah. you know, this happens. You know, you, you'll be coming to a different season in your ministry. And sometimes you're tempted to say, I'm going to go back to what was comfortable. The default setting. I'm going to go back to what I used to know. I'm going to go back to... I'm going to go back to fishing. Yeah. It's what they knew. Yeah. So he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And so they decided to go fishing. But what you find out is when you go to go back to what used to work, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. And so when Jesus shows up on the shore that day and he says, do you have any meat? You know, it's like asking a fisherman, did you catch any fish? Yeah. You know, and they got to say no. Yeah. And uh, they're like, no, we don't have any fish. And Jesus says, well, then cast your net on the right side of the ship. And if they're anything like the rest of us, our sarcasm kicks in and we say, I tried that side of the ship and I've fished that side and I've changed the bait and I, you know, I'm a fisher, professional fisherman, I've tried that, but I'll give it one more try. But at the sound of his voice, they responded again. And when they do, they bring in a great net, uh, you know, catch of fish. Yeah. And Peter said, that's the voice of my Lord. Yeah. That's the voice that I heard on the shore when he said, follow me yeah. and I'll make you fishers of men. And so he comes back to the shore and you know that Jesus sits down with him, bread and fish already on the fire. And Jesus restores Peter in the sense that, you know, Peter denies him three times, but Jesus sits down at the shore with him, even in Peter's broken state, mm -hmm. disappointed in himself. Lord, I'll die for you. I'll go to the cross with you, you know. And Jesus looks at Peter and said, Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. And our King James Bible cuts off right there at John chapter 13. But John 14 starts out, but don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And I really believe if that's not just a scripture that we preach at funerals, yep. that we say, you know, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I really think what he's saying to Peter is, Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to blow up big time. Yep. But don't let your heart be troubled. Just hang on, because yeah. I'm going to prepare a place for us. And that place, while I believe in a place called heaven, yeah. and while I believe that he's prepared for a place for us, I believe the place he prepared for us is a place Absolutely. called Calvary. Yeah. And so he said, just hang on, to the point that when Peter denies the Lord, hears the sound of the rooster crow, the scripture says he turns and the Lord looks at him. And they come eye to eye, and Peter walks away sorrowful. But I really believe what he's saying when he looks Peter in the eye, he's saying, don't let your heart be troubled. Mm -hmm. Remember what I told you. Yep. He sits down with Peter on the shore in a broken state and said, Peter, do you love me? And I think by the third time when Peter says, Lord, you know I love you, he realized I denied him three times, 
But the same guy that I denied three times gave me opportunity all three times to come back and say, you know I love you. And God restores Peter. You know, all of us, you know, want to sound like Peter. You know, we're the Time Magazine Man of the Year for yeah. a moment when you say, you know, who men say I am? Well, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, you yeah. know, and flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But in a moment of weakness, you know, we find out that what we think we can, you know, we think we have the strength or we think, you know, we can uh, be strong or whatever. We find out all of us at times have been in a state where we've been disappointed in ourselves, or, or broken or, or felt blemished or, you know, rather it was, you know, sometimes it's just our insecurities or our inferiorities or our, you know, in ministry and things like that. God continually didn't, didn't necessarily call the qualified. He qualified those whom he called. Yep. God chose ordinary men and women to do extraordinary things. Yep. He chose a publican. And usually the ones nobody else would have chosen. Just he like chose a story. publican like Matthew to mm. be part of his team. Yep. He chose a Judas. Yep. You know, he identified with the people of the day and even those people in his closest, the band of his closest men you know, had struggles and had weaknesses and moments of faith, you know, where their faith was tempted or they were weak in their faith. But you know, um, and so in the instance where, you know, Jesus says to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. Don't be tempted to go back to what, don't go back to what was normal. And don't go back to the state that you were once mm -hmm. in. And he gives him healing and raises him up and touches the crippled, broken part, you know, of his being mm -hmm. and restores that man on the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. There's so many powerful pictures here, you know, the, the scurvy, the scabbed. I mean, you see him healing the leper, open the eyes of the blind, the blemished, you know. Uh, he just, you know, the, the, the running sores, the superfluous woman, uh, the flat nose, the, the broken stones are people who are impotent or unable to produce, or the eunuchs. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've had so many wonderful things that you've said about some of these things, you know. We've got a little bit more time. Do you want to go into some more of well, them? Well, you know, when you talk about scurvy, um, that's basically you're talking about a diet issue. Yeah. You are what you eat, yeah. you know, and uh, and you say all the time, you know, we, we ate yeah. our way into this problem. We can eat our way out yeah. of it. You know, Adam and Eve of uh, sin in the garden when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yep. And so God puts them out of the garden. And I remember as a kid in Sunday school seeing the picture of them leaving the garden, you know, and they're you know, afraid of the angel and the angel and the cherubim is there at the at the gate of, the, of Eden. Mm -hmm. And we always say that, you know, we got put them out of the garden and blocked the way, you know, but the scripture says that he put an angel and a, uh, a cherubim and a flaming sword there to keep the way mm -hmm. into the garden, Eden. not to keep them out of the yep. garden of Eden, what he Let's does is away. separates from the tree of life, he said, because we don't want to live them forever in a fallen state. Yeah. And so he keep, puts the chairman there to keep the way. And as you were sharing before, all through the scriptures, God gives them in the wilderness the picture of the manna from heaven. Supplies the water from the rock. Then he gets over into the New Testament and says, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they're dead, but I'm the true bread that came down from heaven that man could eat thereof. And, you know, mm -hmm. and so he begins to talk about, you, you know, a diet, a diet, what's on the mm -hmm. table. You know, we talked about Mephibosheth and when he's invited to the king's table. When you roll up under the king's table and he puts the linen tablecloth across your lap and serves you that bread yep. and that wine. Yep. You know, I like my bread broken. I like my wine red mm -hmm. like his blood yep. and the lamb finished. Yeah. You know, uh, when they came out of Exodus, what they ate was what gave them the power yeah. to come out of Exodus, yeah. you know. And so we see in there with scurvy that, you know, uh, God ministers there and, and brings healing even in the diet. Uh, the uh, superfluous, you know, we talked about being, uh, superfluous is to have an overabundance of something. So mm -hmm. if you have an overabundance of like fluid, you mm -hmm. would have a superfluous amount. And that's called an edema, yeah. you know, that, and, and it's a heart issue. Yeah. So when your heart is not functioning correctly, it's not allowing the kidneys to take the fluid off the body, and so then you become you have a superfluous uh, amount of 
fluid mm -hmm. on your body. And I can remember as kids, mom telling us we had heart trouble and dropsy. We dropped down, didn't have the heart to get back up. And I <laughs> thought that was something she made up, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. But dropsy, yeah, you know, was in the Bible, was God man. heals, the, Jesus he heals the man. He was superfluous. He yeah. had a fluid build up. Yeah. Jesus heals the man he with He had dropsy. a heart issue. He had a heart issue. And that's what I think, you know, Jesus is after. It's a heart issue. Yeah. People say to me a lot of times, especially, you know, uh, in areas of like pastors and things like that, how I should handle this or should handle that. And, and basically my answer is always, it's a heart issue. Yeah. I, I gauge the heart. Yeah. You know, what's the heart? Is the heart true? Yeah. Is the heart genuine? Because I can work with a lot of things if the heart is right. right. You know, I can deal with people's issues. Yeah. Even behavior. You know, I tell people, see, law can change behavior, but grace changes the heart. Yeah. And if you get the heart changed, the behavior is going to line up. But we, we so focus sometimes on the behavior, we, we, we miss the heart. And that's what, you know, you see what David was called. He, I mean, everybody looked better than him. Everybody looked more qualified. But he was the run of the bunch, and he was the one that had the right heart. And that's, right. that's the issue is the heart, you know. Right. If you're ever going to raise up a king, it's going to be somebody who's going to have a heart of a shepherd. Yeah. You know, and so when David didn't look the part, you know, when he didn't, Dad didn't even have confidence in him. Nobody yeah. even bothered to call him when the prophet came for dinner. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. mom didn't. He send didn't even make the first lineup. <laughs> yeah. Mom he didn't wasn't going to just him. get picked last. He didn't even make the first lineup. <laughs> he didn't make the first cut. Right, but mom doesn't call him. Dad doesn't call him. You know, <laughs> but God is. You know, God. You know, He said, "Man looks on the on the outer part." You know, uh, yeah. they chose Saul because he looked the part. Yeah, but he was a disappointment. Yeah. He didn't have the heart yeah. of you know leader. Yeah. But, you know, I've sh shared with, you know, our kids and even at youth camp and things like that, if, uh, you know, the road to the kingdom is through servanthood and through the heart. You know, David says, you need a shepherd, I can be a shepherd. And so he serves as a shepherd. And I love, even after David's anointed, his dad doesn't send him, you know, they don't start calling him the king and they don't bow to him. They don't do his, they, he's like, okay, David, the sheep are waiting. You, you know, he sends out. him back out. <laughs> yeah. And so he's like, you need a shepherd, I can be a shepherd. And then... You know, he says, I need you to run errands up to the brethren, you know. Yeah. And so he said, you need an errand boy? I can be an errand boy. And, you know, and then he said, while he's up there, Saul's tormented with an evil spirit. You need a worshiper? I can be a worshiper. And then the giant presents itself. You need a giant killer? I can be a giant killer. And then you need a king? I can be a king. But so many times I think we, we start, we think we want to start out as king. But, you know, I look for the heart. Yeah. You've got a heart to serve. If yeah. you'll serve at the level of, you know, you need somebody to work in the hospitality ministry. You need me to deliver the food to the brethren who are in battle. I can do that. Yep. You know, you need me to be a worshiper. I can be a worshiper. Yep. You need to, whatever you need me to do, because I believe God looks at the heart. And it's not about our outward appearance. It's not about, you know, um, what we see on the outside of people. And I think sometimes we... Uh, we cast people away that maybe was the treasure. And, and the Lord shared, that, you know, just dropped this thought in my heart just a couple uh, months ago. And it was the, concerning the uh, coin in the fish's mouth. And the Lord said to me one day, the treasure you may need might be in the fish that you want to throw back. Yeah. But the treasure was in the fish's mouth. And, you know, yeah. he's called us to be fishers of men. In other words, you know, when he called the disciples, I called you to be fishers of men. But so often we will overlook a treasure because we don't see the value of the fish. Even when he gives the parable of the, um, you know, the pearl, and you know, he said he said the kingdom of God is like a, a, a net that's is like a drag net. And we in that day and season they would use a casting net, and a casting net was a net that catches the surface fish, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But he said the kingdom of heaven is like a drag net. And a dragnet would go all the way, it was weighted, it would go all the way to the bottom, and what would it do was catch bottom feeders. Mm -hmm. and of course, you know, under the Jewish mindset, that's considered unclean. Yeah. You don't eat the shrimp, you yeah. don't eat the, catfish, you know, the yeah. catfish and, you yeah. know, the pearl. Yeah. And he said, the, the you know, it's like a pearl that's hidden in the field. Well, you didn't, an uh, oyster would have been considered unclean because yeah. it's a bottom feeder. Yeah. But what he's saying is the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet, it goes to the depths yeah. and to the bottom of the yeah. sea and it gets the bottom feeders. Yeah. It gets everything that was considered unclean, unworthy, unrighteous. Everybody who's hit their bottom even. Right, mm -hmm. and the kingdom, that's what the kingdom is. Not just a catching net, a casting net that catches the surface fish, yeah. but to the depths, to the deepest, darkest depths. 
I believe the kingdom of God can touch you wherever you are in a prison cell, in a in a hospital bed, in a you know a bad relationship, a, a you know whatever it is, in an addiction, wherever it is, you might think that you have hit the bottom of the bottom. Yep. You may have think that that you are unworthy, that you're unclean. But Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a dragnet that's cast into sea that brought in all manner of fish. Thank God. We come from a generation of uh, bootleggers and, and our background yeah. was some bottom feeders. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, 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 you know, it, we might say that in a way that might sound bad, but, you know, the power of our testimony is God stepped into the destiny of our life and turned the life around that had he not intervened, would have had a whole other turnout. Yep. But God was able to go to the depths of the sea and touch a man and a woman, yep. change their course of history, and that would and that would be a voice that would touch the nations yep. of the earth. Yep. Who knew yep. the power of the cross? Yep. But that's what the kingdom of God is. Yep. And so if you think you're in the depths too, too low, too deep, or too hard where God can't reach you, you're just what he's looking for. Yep. You're just what God is looking for. And it's called unblemished, and you may <laughs> feel like you're unblemished, but I'm telling you, he's, he's, you're exactly what he's looking for. God stepped into our family, like Lisa said, and turned things around, and four generations later, the children, grandchildren, grandsons, granddaughters, daughters, sons, serving Jesus, touching the nations of the earth. You can turn your life around. This, this really, this ministry is dedicated to folk who, who been pushed away or felt like they're disqualified, who feel like they can't make it. That's the new covenant was given. I mean, it shouldn't just be our ministry. It is. There's many ministries out there that are doing this, but, but uh, you're not too broken. You're not too blemished that God can't step in and search out those things that were disqualified under an old covenant and qualify you because he's the true bread that came down from heaven and you're not disqualified from eating the bread of your God. You are invited to the table. You can turn your life around today simply by Absolutely. receiving what he's done. And uh, like many of these, just the response that they had was, be it unto me, according to your word, Mary said. and and others that simply received what Jesus had to offer. Uh, we've had a great time. You can get the book. It's called Unblemished. Go to Amazon. Uh, you'll be blessed. You can go and listen to Lisa's podcast as well. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to sow a seed into the ministry, take a moment to call the number on the screen. You can give via credit card that way, or you can go to our website. If you'd like to become a partner, there's a place there where you can simply have a recurring uh, debt to that card or whatever, but you can send check or money order. We do need your help. It takes that to run the ministry to keep everything running on the air. God bless you, and thank you for joining us again this week. God bless you. I'm very excited to announce the release of my newest book. It is titled, From Law to Grace, A Kingdom Paradigm Shift. In this book, we talk about how the gospel is not about a law you have to keep. It is about receiving a life that will keep you. It is not about living this life out of fear. It is about living a life of faith. It is not about rules. It's about a relationship with a loving Father. It is about moving from the old covenant government of condemnation to the new covenant government of affirmation. It is about living life as a citizen of the kingdom right now.